Good morning and welcome to this IFG live event on how ready business is for Brexit. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Maddie Timon Jack. I'm a senior researcher leading the Brexit team at the Institute for Government. Now, Brexit hasn't been quite as far up the news agenda as it was last year for many different reasons, although it does seem to be changing in the, over the last couple of weeks. Um, but a lot of the discussion when it has appeared in the papers has focused on whether or not there will be a deal. But regardless of the outcome of the negotiations, we know the UK is now set to leave the single market and the customs union at the end of the year. This has implications for all of our lives, the food we eat, the cars we drive and the UK's place in the global economy. The deadline for extending the transition period has passed and there are now less than six months to go. At the same time, as we are all so keenly aware, the UK has been coping with a global pandemic. This has absorbed government time and has had a significant impact on businesses across the UK. Over the weekend, the government announced it would be investing £705 million in the GB EU border. It's also launched its comms campaign today, the UK's new start, Let's Get Going. And the border operating model, setting out the processes at the GB EU border, is going to be published later today. So what does this all mean for businesses preparing for Brexit? What impact has coronavirus had? How much depends on whether a deal is agreed? And what more does the government need to do? With me to, dis to discuss all these questions and more is an excellent panel. I'm joined by Ian Wright, Chief Executive of the Food and Drink Federation, representing the UK's biggest manufacturing sector. I'm also joined by Sonali Parekh, Policy Director at the Federation of Small Businesses, representing small and medium sized businesses across the UK. We're also joined by Lloyd Mulcarin, Policy Manager at the Society for Motor Manufacturers and Traders, the leads on customs. And last but definitely not least, I'm joined by George Riddell, Director of Trade, trade strategy at EY, a multinational professional services firm that's been advising clients on preparing for Brexit, as well as making changes to its own operations. Before we get going, just to say that this event is on the record and a recording will be available afterwards. Please do tweet along using the hashtag IFGBrexit and ask questions using the chat functions on your screen. Please do send them in as we go and we'll try and get through as many of them as possible, although I can't promise we'll get through all of them. Now, Ian, I'd like to start with you. One of the more prominent news stories, particularly at the start of the pandemic, was the rush to stockpile toilet paper, pasta and other tin goods. I also think there was a period of time when flour was also nearly impossible to find. Um, but on the whole, we have seen that the food and drink sector has adapted rapidly to the impact of coronavirus on shopping habits. Now, do you think that this experience has helped or hindered preparations for the changes to the end of the year? Well, I think that the experience is in many ways extraordinary. Um, so for the last five, four or five months, we've had half a million people going to work every day um, and producing at a rate not ever seen before because of the fact that everybody was at home and because we had to produce in much larger quantities than normal because we'd lost the 20 or 30 percent of capacity or, or consumption that normally goes to what we call out of home, which is hospitality, uh, food to go, sandwich shops and contract catering. And different manufacturers often produce for different parts of that um, spectrum. And so those who were allowed, who were remaining to produce for retail have, have been producing at extraordinary rates. And that's been a great triumph and a huge tribute to those um, what we call the hidden heroes of people who've been at work all the way through this lockdown. I think the second thing that's extraordinary is that the food has kept flowing. So we import 40% of our food and at the start of the lockdown in March, we were that figure is much higher. It reduces quite ra radically over the summer and then goes back up in the winter. So as UK production becomes available, um, we consume it. So we're probably, the balance at the moment is probably much more like 60, 40 in favour of import of, uh, of our own food and imports are much lower and will continue to be much lower through the next couple of months. Um, and yet the food has kept flowing despite it coming from France or Italy or Spain. So that is an extraordinary tribute to the um, resilience of those markets, but also to all the preparations that were done for a no deal Brexit in uh, 2019. Um, all of those preparations have been put in, into action and they have worked. So borders have been opened, uh, online uh, approvals have been allowed instead of paper approvals, systems have been simplified um, and that has worked. Now, the one thing we should be clear is that the government shouldn't assume just because those preparations for a no deal Brexit worked this time, 
that they'll work in six months time. And the reason for that is it's a different exit. Um, and as we're going to see today, the borders model, um, which is going to be put into place, I suspect, and I don't think we'll see it all today, is going to be very, very much more complicated. There will be a lot more friction. That means a lot more cost. That means a lot more delay. And the UK food system relies on just in time. So shelves are filled in real time as they as the as the products that were on them were consumed. And whether that whether the just in time system can survive the sorts of controls and the sorts of uh, friction that we're about to put in place is a really moot point. So in this case, success in the immediate past is not a predictor of the future. And I, I think we need lots of answers. We asked the government over 90 questions in the last couple of weeks about how the models will work on incredibly detailed uh, issues. So, you know, there's one particular one, which is a bet noir of mine, which has continued to dog us through the whole of the last two years. The question of heat treated pallets, um, which is important for food. Now, do you know what? I've been in this business 35 years and I know it looks like that. Um, and I didn't expect my career to end with me becoming an expert on heat treated pallets. Um, but in many ways, it's a metaphor for the level of detail that the government needs to get into. And so far of those 90 questions, I think we've probably had half a dozen answered. That's not because they're being difficult. It's because they don't know. And in the next two or three months, they're going to need to know the answers to almost all of those. Turning to, to you, Lloyd, there hasn't been as much discussion um, about the impact of, of COVID on the motor fan manufacturing sector. But we do know that Brexit is likely to have a significant impact because of the complex supply chains involved. So I was wondering whether you can sort of also talk us through how coronavirus might has impacted the sector over the last few months and what that actually means as, as you start preparing for the end of the year. Absolutely. I think that the, the coronavirus impact since now February uh, has had a catastrophic impact on the industry. What we actually saw first is because of where the, the virus started is that supply chains started to break down with companies in those far East Asian markets having to shut first as those countries moved to lockdown before we did here in the UK and as it gradually moved west. Uh, therefore, that ended up causing the production and registration side of the industry here to completely stop. So if we look for the first half of the year, the registration markets lost 615,000 units, um, down 48% on where we were last year. If you look at May alone, we're down 97% on the registration side of things. And then if we turn to production, that's year to date down 41%. Uh, and production in May was down 95%. So it's fair to say that the industry has ground to a complete halt, uh, unlike what Ian touched on with the, the food and drink side of things. And we've also had tens of thousands of employees also furloughed. So when we look at, therefore, the ability to prepare, the people haven't been on site to be able to prepare. Those conversations haven't been able to be had. And also COVID has now been the number one priority. If we look back to the last three years or so, Brexit has been the number one priority for the industry. But what we've seen this year is that drastically shift to COVID and a move into survival. Uh, because that's what the industry has been doing and cash flow in the short term has been very challenged. So I think now as we look to the second half of the year, every company needs to make investments in order to be able to cope with the new border operating model from the 1st of January next year. The challenge, especially for the, those small businesses who may have exhausted credit lines to survive in the short term, is that they're no longer going to be able to put that investment in. The business case gets that much harder. Uh, and also they don't know the detail and I know we'll come back onto that shortly. What I think is slightly different is that our bigger vehicle manufacturers are slightly better prepared. And I'm cautious with the word slightly because they both have the resource and the knowledge of how to do imports and exports with the rest of the world anyway. But the resounding call and voice that we're hearing from all of our members is that we need the details now. How, how much has the sort of preparations for no deal last year helped the sector? Has that, is there sort of any way you can sort of copy and paste uh, your sort of preparations from last year for this year um, or, or are we in a completely different world? 
I think some of the plans that businesses had put in place for October last year still stand, but government have changed some of their plans as well now for the 1st of January compared to October last year. So the tariff schedule, the, the original no deal tariff schedule is completely different to now the UK global tariff schedule moving forward. There isn't zero tariffs on a number of automotive components when imported into the UK. There are now tariffs of between two and four percent on those. And then also we heard strongly from the government that they would prioritise flow over revenue last year. Hopefully that's the case now, but actually how does that play out? We're no longer talking about transitional simplified procedures anymore. We've heard Michael Gove talk uh, about a month ago now about this phased approach as well. What do the registration processes look like for that? Do we all re numbers which were automatically rolled out to companies last year still stand for now? Um, and and also just how businesses need to re-engage with the subject as well because it's no longer at the forefront of their mind they've now got to try and pick up where they left off and understand what has changed in addition thanks and i mean bringing you in sonali now lloyd's already touched on the fact that small it's sort of harder for small businesses to get ready and we know that last year small businesses were largely not prepared for, for no deal, or at least they were the, the least well prepared. And we also know that small and medium sized businesses are the majority of businesses in the, in the UK. So from your perspective, how much has Brexit sort of been on the agenda for these businesses? How much did they know that they need to, to get preparations in place? And what are your sort of biggest concerns when looking at the preparedness challenge ahead of the end of the year? Thanks, Maddie. Um, I don't think it will be a surprise to say that the only issue that most smaller businesses across the UK have been focused on is surviving the coronavirus crisis. That's been a real challenge because, as you would expect, smaller businesses are operating often on very thin margins and cash flow has been a major challenge for them. And as we're sort of moving away from sort of the emergency support that the government put in place, which has really been a form of life support for many smaller businesses, many commentators, including ourselves, actually think that these early stages of recovery are actually when smaller businesses are at their most exposed. So, for example, with the you know, groundbreaking job retention scheme that has saved so many jobs, you know, we are going to see employer contributions being required in one form or another from the beginning of August. Many smaller businesses have taken on external finance in the form of these emergency loans, um, the bounce back micro loan scheme for the first time. Now they're beginning to think about, well, when that interest free period comes to an end, how are they going to be able to repay that debt, if at all? And that's why sort of thinking on recapitalization is just so incredibly important. How can smaller businesses pay debt back in such a way that enables them to survive and to actually grow? So with all of those sort of first order issues in their mind and, and, and you know, the biggest issue really is around demand. Um, we saw the very welcome back cuts announced last week to food and attractions and to accommodation, but the general consensus is, you know, it's very uncertain what's going to happen to domestic demand and to consumption. So smaller businesses simply don't know what their revenue, what their cash flow is going to look like. Therefore, that is a very challenging context in which to ask them to think about making the changes that they will inevitably have to make to be able to cope with or to be able to maximise their opportunities, whether we have a comprehensive free trade agreement with the EU or we don't. So we're all acknowledging, for example, that customs declarations are going to be necessary. Now, that's going to be particularly challenging for those smaller businesses that have exclusively traded with the EU to date. And they've done that generally because there are no tariffs and there are minimal non-tariff barriers. Um, therefore, you know, a lot of the ease of that will depend upon, you know, what's agreed or if there is a free trade agreement agreed or not. But in terms of just, you know, preparing for customs declarations, um, We've heard the announcements about the sort of the phasing in process for imports from the EU um, into the UK and sort of a six month grace period almost um, before sort of full import declarations and import duties and import VAT has got to be paid. Um, and, and having the option of going down that road perhaps to support cash flow. However, the reality is smaller businesses are still going to have to be providing information um, to support the customs declarations processes, which they will be legally liable for, whether they use an intermediary or not, sort of commodity codes, unique consignment numbers, customs value, customs procedures. So it's incredibly important that they have the capability um, to be able to make those decisions and to be able to provide accurate information. And at the moment, there's a concern that the bandwidth might simply not be there right now because they're, they're, they're really focusing with how to survive the coronavirus crisis. 
Similarly, um, in relation to the Northern Ireland Protocol for, you know, those of our smaller businesses that are exporting goods from GB into Northern Ireland, it's acknowledged that there is going to definitely be greater friction. Um, so, so, you know, how can that process become as streamlined as possible? And, and knowing what those rules are going to be and what that additional friction is going to look like is going to be absolutely essential because one consistent message you're always going to hear from smaller businesses is we will adapt, we will make changes, but you've got to give us the time to be able to make those changes. And the clock is ticking. And, and sort of you mentioned the time point uh, with the six months we've got left. I mean, is that long enough? I mean, you know, the, the government is planning on publishing border operating model this afternoon. We'll see what that, that sort of does fill in a lot of the gaps from the version they, they shared last week, with, sorry, last month with industry. Do you at this point sort of feel like six months, if they do share the information now, will give those small businesses enough time to adapt? I think it's going to be extremely challenging given the backdrop of the coronavirus crisis. There have been changes, for example, you know, the, the previous speaker talked about how the, the no deal easements were originally sort of based around TSP, Transitional Simplified Procedures. We're now looking at a different model, very much both focused around CSFP. Um, and, and, you know, the, the wider fact is that smaller businesses are going to have to make investments both in terms of their time um, and in terms of procedures. Many of them will have furloughed staff that would be able to support them in this process, may not know if they're going to be able to take those staff back on because it's going to de depend upon what happens with demand. So it is going to be extremely challenging. And a lot of it also depends on the behaviour of other actors. So, for example, will intermediaries, given that there have been um, changes in representation rules, will they actually be more willing to now take on smaller businesses as their clients? Will their services be affordable? There are so many um, different links that will impact upon whether small businesses are going to be ready or not, and many of those will be outside of a smaller business's direct control. So sort of wait and see for the moment, I guess. George, sort of turning to you, I mean, a lot of the Brexit debate has been about goods, quotas, tariffs, uh, borders. From your sort of perspective, from the services perspective, I mean, how how much firstly, I guess, has has coronavirus impacted on the sector? And again, has that been sort of uniform or other different aspects of it that, that you feel is impacted more? Um, but also sort of from that, how confident are you really that that services sector will, will be ready for, for the changes coming at the end of the year? Thanks, Manny. So I think I very much agree that the discussion today around Brexit has been focused on the goods aspects. Um, when you look at sort of a lot of the news reports, taking, you know, photos of trucks waiting at a border for a lot of people is much more compelling than people in suits catching an aeroplane to have a presentation um, in the EU. But I think really looking at the services aspects, there are some that are fairly fundamental that regardless of whether there's going to be an FTA agreed between the UK and the EU, there is a lot of friction on the services side coming as well. We we can obviously talk a lot about the immigration system um, that's being um, announced. I think this announcement today as well um, around what the UK's future immigration system is going to look like and, and some of the specifics that we're still waiting for. But not many people have been talking about the limits that will be placed on business activities um, when you're traveling over to the EU27 or European nationals coming over here to the UK. Right now, it doesn't matter what you do, you can jump on a plane and go and provide a service. Whereas under, as soon as you're in an FTA or a no deal territory, you're, the allowable activities under short-term business visit rules actually are very restricted. And if you go over and work, that can then trigger the need for work visas or additional requirements. I think also looking at some of the other challenges that we're going to be facing, there's going to be restrictions on establishment. So this is where UK firms could face restrictions for setting up or maintaining offices um, in certain services sectors and in certain member states. Now, these restrictions can include things like equity caps, nationality requirements for boards of directors and the like that really could you know, limit where UK firms operate going forward. There's also going to be fairly significant regulatory changes. I know financial services has, uh, and the equivalence debate and passporting has gained a lot of, uh, of airtime. But there's also things like accountancy and law will face additional restrictions and then broadcasting and audiovisual services as well, um, likely to lose a lot of market access going forward. Coming to, the, um, to your point around COVID and the impact of that, I think really interestingly we've all obviously moved a lot online 
and we're all doing what more and more webinars we're all on teams and zoom calls and everything else and it's the data flow issue um, in the brexit discussion i think is incredibly incredibly important um, if there's no adequacy decision on given by the european commission before the end of the year that will trigger some fairly significant changes that businesses will need to adapt to in order to transfer uh, personal data from the eu into the uk on, on all of those sorts of issues that you've sketched out and, and the changes that are coming down the track you sort of i think you've, with most of them you seem to suggest that they're pretty much going to happen whether or not there is an fta agreed i mean is there anything within an fta that will make some of that easier for businesses who are looking sort of to continue to trade into the EU? So there are a number, FTAs traditionally do less on services. It's not to say that they do nothing, but once you're in an FTA type territory, they, it, they do just do less um, than on the good side. So they will make some of the establishment requirements easier. There will be additional mode four commitments. Those are the commitments around the movement of people temporarily to provide that service. Um, they can look at eliminating some of the market access requirements that, that the EU has as part of its sort of traditional third country um, regime. But I think also the important thing to, to mention is that as soon as you leave the single market, the EU for purposes of third country companies starts to splinter into individual member state rules and regulations that it's not a unified market like it is for goods that once you get it across the customs border into the eu you have free movement um, for services it is slightly more complicated and you don't have that same freedom once you get into an eu member state and i guess very briefly finally i mean how prepared do you think the sector is for these changes coming down the track i think it's you, we've seen huge variance um, among the sort of clients that I've worked with over the past three years. I think the most important thing in terms of preparedness is really senior commitment to getting the company prepared because Brexit does touch on so many different issues from your logistics team to your HR team to your IT and systems team that unless they're talking to each other and preparing together, so take the customs issue. Yes, you can have your supply chain and logistics teams making sure that, you know, they're ready to submit the paperwork, but they also need IT systems in order to submit that information. So they need to be, you need to be working across the company in order to prepare. And really we've seen it much more effective when you do have that senior leadership within a company driving those changes and preparations forward. Great, thanks. I'm going to turn to a, a question from the Q&A now. Um, this is from Rory Palmer, who's former MEP. Um, and I think, Ian, I might put this question to you uh, to give you warning. Um, I mean, one of the questions he, he's asked is, is, are the panellists able to provide some insights on how the COVID pandemic has impacted government bandwidth in planning for 31st of December, 1st of January? I mean, how has that played out day to day? Because I know, Ian, you'll have been in sort of close contact around COVID. But have you seen how that's impacted how much the government can do on Brexit? Well, I think the fact that we're only discussing these things in the middle of July for the first time is the biggest indication of that. Um, many of these issues should have been settled. Uh, you could argue that they should have been settled before we decided, certainly you argue that they should have been settled before we decided not to extend the transition period. Though I totally understand that that's a shibboleth and, and you know, has to be worshipped at. Um, but uh, if you, that's probably the wrong sentence construction for which I apologise. Um, the, um, but these should have been being knocked over as we go throughout the early part of the later part of the spring and early part of the summer. I mean, we, my, my impression is that certain parts of government have done an absolutely brilliant job through uh, Brexit, through the COVID uh, crisis. And I would, I would particularly mention DEFRA which hasn't always been uh, seen as the most impressive department over the last 20 years, but has had an absolutely extraordinarily effective uh, crisis um, at, led by a brilliant permanent secretary in Tamara Finkelstein and um, uh, and through, I think, a really, really successful period for the Secretary of State, George Eustace. But their whole attention has been on COVID, uh, rightly so, by the way, 
I mean, you know, there are nobody could possibly argue they shouldn't have been doing that. So it's only in the last two or three weeks that we've seen um, very senior officials return to the subjects that they were previously covering in March before 29, let's say 29th of February as the cutoff, as people began to move away. And I think that has that cannot fail to have a major impact on government's bandwidth. Similarly, um, I think this government has a rather interesting approach to the way it makes announcements. So it will trail and I, I'm not this is not a criticism because I, I, I have a particular view that Michael Gove is one of the three most effective ministers of the last 30 or 40 years. I think with Heseltine and Mandelson, that he is he is the preeminent government minister being a minister. He's good at ministering or whatever the active verb is. Um, uh, whether you agree with him or not, he is a very, very, very able minister. And what they're doing is they're making announcements. We're going to do this. This is what we're going to do. Very big picture. And then I suspect what happens is that they trial the detail, having made the announcement before they m actually put out the specifics. So I'm pretty sure that's what's happened with a number of these things over the weekend. I think they poll some of this stuff and decide that we'll do that bit, not that bit. Now, that is also a delaying issue because clearly you're going to wait till you see what how people react. And, and I think some of that is 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 modern government and it's, we've not seen it before, but it's it's fine. That's their choice. The key question is, will they be ready? And the trouble with will they be ready, will we be ready, is that we'll only know afterwards that we weren't. And that's, for me, a, a, a big concern. So I repose enormous amounts of confidence in Gove and in Eustace. And they are, I am you know, not necessarily ideologically well disposed towards them, but their effectiveness is not in doubt for me. But the question that is, is with all these people returning and with government still working remotely, which I know probably for many around this call has been a, a, a you know has been a success I'm not I'm not as convinced of the success of remote working I think that's yet to be decided we'll see you know we'll see afterwards um, uh, in the immortal phrase of Warren Buffett when the tide goes out you see who has been swimming without their shorts and at the moment I don't think we know who has been effective in this lockdown and who hasn't that's when the results are counted so I think it's a big question mark and I think it's a really good question. Lloyd, I think you wanted to come in. You had you sort of had thoughts on this. Yeah, thanks, Maddie. Just in terms of government bandwidth and preparedness, we sit here on the 13th of July. Um, we were expecting a border operating model, at least the first version back in March. So even just from that timeline of four months, you can see sort of the bandwidth challenges, but not just government on their own, but as we've already discussed, businesses have already had. Uh, and it's going to remain a challenge as well. COVID's not now through, uh, and we're back talking about just Brexit. We're now having to work with them on, in parallel as well. So whether it's at ministerial level, like Ian touched on, or even at official level, officials are going to be pulled all over the place between the different policies and so are the businesses and our members. Absolutely. And I think as we look forward as well, there's a timing challenge between the border operating model that I'm sure we're all going to go away and look at after the webinar, but also how that interacts with actually a, the UK and the EU negotiating a free trade agreement. So if they do look to negotiate a waiver on safety and security declarations, what does that actually mean in practice for business? We have members that have been talking to their partners about introducing safety and security declarations from day one. Now we've had Michael Gove introduce an easement, but they would still like to be able to submit it because they've already put the time and investment into being able to do that. And the same with the customs declarations, which I think Sonali touched on earlier. We know that customs declarations are going to have to be made but what's the content on the customs declaration? Will they be some form of simplified declaration? Or are we talking about your usual declaration that you have for UK rest of the world trade as well? So I think as we move forward, there's never going to be a final time, point in time, when we can say every business is prepared. The landscape's going to keep changing. Businesses are going to have to keep adapting. And we won't know until our trucks are moving through the border on the 1st of January, how well it's working and then subsequently through the remainder of the year. 
Sonali, if I if I bring you in now, I mean, I guess I'd be interested in your thoughts also on on the government bandwidth question, particularly as FSB obviously represents sort of a range of businesses across different sectors. Um, but also, I guess the, the question of how how different sectors may be better or worse prepared. And again, some of this this um, these these questions around the extent to which deal or deal, deal or no deal makes a difference. So the sort of information that's still outstanding and has that impacted on which sectors can actually prepare more um, would be quite interesting to get into. Sure. So on the bandwidth question, you know, hats off to the government. We have seen groundbreaking initiatives um, of, a, of a scale that I don't think has been witnessed before in UK public policy making, you know, the coronavirus drop retention scheme, the self-employment income support scheme, the bounce back microloan scheme, adaptability, um, and, and that have made a material difference to small businesses survival over the next few months. There's no doubt about that. Equally, I don't think we can make an argument that that um, has not taken a lot of resource, a lot of attention and a lot of focus. And I think it's really important to remember that um, even if the emergency support is beginning to taper off, there are severe challenges for the UK economy going ahead. And a lot of need for further support delivered in different ways and through different mechanisms, but a lot of um, policy making bandwidth will very much be continue to be focused in that space and, and, and rightly so. In terms of the impact upon different sectors, you know, for example, right now, if you're a small business involved in automotive or pharma or chemicals or so forth, you know, you're going to be particularly interested, for example, in you know where do you stand on rules and rules of origin, and that's an area where uh, a free trade agreement could make a significant difference. You know the government's very much pushing for diagonal accumulation, um, and you know, we are also keen to see ways of ensuring that a smaller business doesn't do what they sometimes do at the moment, which is to basically say we won't bother to trade on preferential terms, we won't take advantage of preference because of the compliance burden of rules of origin requirements, and that is so self defeating because it essentially means that smaller businesses are not taking advantage of the preferences that are there. And we know from our survey work that, you know, 36 percent of smaller businesses think that formalised free trade agreements can be really beneficial to their trading aspirations. So the trick is how can a free trade agreement can be agreed that will actually work for smaller businesses. And that's why we've been pushing really hard that the UK EU FTA should have a small business chapter. That's not currently included within the, you know, the list of negotiating objectives, but it's, it's really crucial for us that that is contained. The e-commerce provisions within um, a free trade agreement can be incredibly important for smaller businesses, as can um, the rules around customs facilitations. And of course, it's not just about goods. For those of our smaller businesses, where either the business owner or a member of staff needs to travel to another country to be able to discharge a service. Um, the rules around sort of, you know, those short term business visitors are absolutely essential. And so is the recognition, um, um, the mutual recognition of professional qualifications. And we know that, you know, the UK is being very ambitious in terms of what it's looking for there. And rightly so, in our view, because that's going to be absolutely crucial to whether a smaller business can continue to go to the EU to be able to perform a function and to be able to discharge a service. So whether it's goods or services and, you know, within goods, there'll be particular sectors that are highly integrated where rules of origin, I think, are going to be even even more important perhaps than for other sectors, you know, agri-food, SPS is going to be absolutely crucial. The purpose of free trade agreements is to try to minimise um, those non-tariff barriers. And that's a really critical point for us that, you know, we can presumably get a free trade agreement that reduces or eliminates tariffs in a large number of areas. But our research shows that it's often non-tariff barriers which can often act as a fixed cost. They're there irrespective of the volume of, you know, goods that are being, for example, exported. It's those it's those kind of non tariff barriers that actually have a disproportionate impact on smaller businesses. And I know that free trade agreements generally are not as good as tackling non tariff barriers as they are tariff barriers. But we would hope to see an ambitious free trade agreement with with the um, EU that does really try and sort of, you know, push the parameters and enable trade to be as easy as possible between the UK um, and the EU, because that's going to be incredibly important for, for smaller businesses in the UK in particular. On the small business chapter, you mentioned that you're sort of lobbying to try and include a chapter on small businesses in the FTA. I mean, how how optimistic are you that 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 might end up being included? Sort of how how is how successful have you been lobbying so far? You know, is the government receptive to that? I mean, we hope so. We, we very much hope so, because, you know, if you look at um, EPA or 
for example, you can see sort of, you know, the importance of having an SME contact point or a designated help desk. A free trade agreement, if it simply just sits there, is of limited value to smaller businesses. They will need help to understand, well, what are the preferences within it that they can take advantage of um, and how can they actually use it to facilitate their international trade and I think that there is a wide recognition that smaller businesses will not have you know dedicated departments that you would find in larger businesses that are really focused on these kinds of issues so they are going to need additional help and support from government to really sort of unlock the benefits of a free trade agreement assuming there is a comprehensive free trade agreement agreed with the EU so I think that there is you know a common sense argument that it is a sensible thing to do. Uh, if I can turn to you, George, um, so Sonali mentioned the, the mutual recognition of professional qualifications and the sort of ambitious ask from the UK. I wonder whether you can um, set out a bit more about what that ask is, but also what does it mean if the EU doesn't agree to it? Or, or do you think the EU will? And actually this, this will be something that, that will make it easier for, for um, the service sector to trade into the EU. Thanks, Manny. So the professional mutual recognition of professional qualifications is an issue that's massively important for the professional services sector in, in which I work. Um, I'm not an order or accountant myself, but certainly my colleagues uh, find this to be an incredibly important issue. And I think we should recognise that mutual recognition of professional qualifications in existing EU FTAs, there's only really been one under the Canada Free Trade Agreement, which only set up a framework for countries with the EU and Canada and their professional bodies to come together to agree mutual recognition. So even though CETA, that Canadian Free Trade Agreement with the EU, does have a framework for mutual recognition of professional qualifications, no recognition has actually happened under it. So what the EU, what the UK has put forward in the FTA negotiations with the EU has been really much more ambitious than CETA. What it seeks to do is provide a pathway to recognition, really looking towards where the theoretical endpoint of that CETA framework could be in 15, 20 years time and try and front load that recognition today. Um, it's certainly been called out during the course of the negotiations as one of the areas where the UK is being unreasonable, is going beyond EU precedents, that this is not a stock standard chapter, this is in fact something new and innovative that the UK government's put forward. It's only something that we as a sector has, have been incredibly supportive of, um, but we should recognise that the reaction and the reception to, to some of that ambition certainly hasn't been entirely positive. One other thing I would mention is that under the withdrawal agreement, there are also provisions for those that already have their qualifications recognised. Um, they will continue to be recognised. So what we're talking about as part of the FTA negotiations is really that forward looking from January, what happens afterwards. It doesn't impact so much those that already have their qualifications recognised. Thanks. And I might also put a question to you while I sort of have you um, from the Q&A. Um, so Robert Morland's asked, what is the effect on foreign investment? And he said, I assume businesses with operations serving the EU will look to move to be inside the single market. And is that something that you would agree with? Um, what, what are your thoughts on that, George? In terms of foreign investment into the UK, a lot depends on, uh, I would say, less about Brexit and more about what domestic policies the government looks to um, initiate over the coming 12 months. We know that there's going to be a refresh of the industrial strategy. We know there's this uh, look to power up uh, regions outside of the southeast. Um, what does that mean in practice? How do your local partnerships and that economic growth really attract new investment from outside of the UK? I think that is much more fundamental to whether or not the UK is an attractive investment destination than, than some of the Brexit discussions. That's really interesting. I'm going to also bring another question in from the Q&A um, for you, Ian. Um, this is from Edward Taylor. Um, he says, given the six month Dover border easements that have caused some concern against WTO, what is the situation for Roro imports of fresh food in January to June 2021? And has asked, is there a national supply constraint? So I wonder if you can shed some light on what you think the border easements will mean for the, for the food supply. I'm not sure what is meant by the words. Is there a the question? Is there a national supply constraint? If he means will supply be impacted, I don't think we know yet. Um, I think the 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 likeliest 
answer is that this will all continue to work reasonably well during the easement period, but that the easement itself is a terribly medieval word that is um, that the easement itself will um, will when it finishes may simply delay um, trouble rather than stop it. Now, I mean, clearly some of the some of the all of these different easements are designed to make sure that the, there isn't a cliff edge on the 1st of January or on the 31st of December. I, I'm moderately uh, and to give them more time. I mean, these are effectively a transition period to. For, um, and, and I think we should see it as that it's a practical way of avoiding saying that you've extended the transition period in the most important bits and extending the transition period. Um, and I think you could possibly see others. Um, I've always thought through all of this that, that it'll be raggedy and untidy and there'll be bits that work very well and there'll be bits that simply don't work and they'll probably be the things that are least visible to the general public. So food supply is massively visible and is therefore crucial to both to the success of the project being seen to we've left the EU, we've left the transition period and it's all, all right, really. That's important. And food supply is probably the most visible of those. Although broadcasting, as was said earlier, is another one. If suddenly, you know, your favourite channel, which happens to be way down on on the fifth screen disappears, you might start to make a fuss. Um, and the I think also the um, the issue will be, can they negotiate are there other parts of the negotiation which will be completed so late that you can't implement them therefore you have to have another kind of flexible move and I suspect we'll see a lot of that and when we get to the Northern Ireland Protocol and I know we're coming to that um, we're going to have to see all sorts of things there because at the moment it's a total shambles. Just very quickly question from me and then I know a couple of the other panellists want to come in. Um, you sort of mentioned about the fact that it's a sort of a transition period of sorts. I mean, the, the thing that the UK government has no control over is what the EU does, right? So there is a, what what's sort of your view on that in terms of, yes, you can introduce easements on this side of the border, but if the EU are implementing full checks, how will that interact, what UK interact with what UK traders need to do? Well, paradoxically, the Northern Ireland Protocol helps the UK there. Um, because uh, in in effect, and I know we're not supposed to say this, but in effect, Northern Ireland is in both the United Kingdom and the EU. Um, and so they can't start monkeying about with the EU parts of that without uh, with the EU Dover Calais without also potentially impacting uh, Cairn Ryan to Larne or Holyhead to Dublin. And those sorts of changes will have to be they'll have to be consistent with that. So I think the the chaos that's the wrong word the the very opaque nature of the Northern Ireland protocol helps the EU be more uh, amenable to flexibility in the early stages of this. It doesn't mean at the end of this it won't there won't be a lot more friction. But in the early stages, I think I think there will be a, a wish to be consistent um, and, you know, trade goes both ways. The trade is very valuable to EU countries. UK is a massive market for EU food, uh, our biggest customer both ways. So there is there is a commercial interest here in making here in making this as flexible as possible. But I still think that at the end of the process, which might be a year from now, or might be even longer from now, I think we will see more friction, more cost, more confusion, and therefore probably in in reality less choice on our shelves as things become either too expensive to deliver or just too much trouble to deliver. That's interesting. Thank, thanks, Ian. Uh, George, I think you wanted to come in and then I'll come to you, Lloyd. Just briefly on the WTO point, and I think a lot's been made of it over the last couple of days, but to my mind, it is a bit of a red herring. Um, it is certainly a risk that needs to be managed. WTO disputes settlement uh, when it does work takes a long time. Um, but what the eventual ruling of a dispute panel is, is countries can do whatever they want. If they breach WTO rules, then it's about how do you compensate and how do you address that with your trading partners? Under WTO rules, you can do anything that you want, but there are there can be consequences to it eventually. 
but it, it, to my mind, it's a risk to be managed rather than a fundamental concern for the government. That's helpful. So I, I, we'd be telling Liz Truss that that same same thing. Um, Lloyd, I think you wanted to come in, I think, on the border point. Yeah, just picking up on the changes that we expect at roll on roll off ports uh, more than anything. So it looks like from the border operating model that we're moving towards a pre lodgement model for those row row ports, um, which will come in in a phased way, we assume from the 1st of January. So the pre lodgement initially will be very light touch, but there'll be some form of information that needs to be shared with government before that movement or entered into the company's own declarance records. And then alongside that, we've got a new system coming in into place. So GVMS, a goods vehicle movement system, something that until about two or three weeks ago, none of the business community had heard about, quite frankly, as well. So we've got businesses currently operating on Chief that are slowly transitioning to CDS as well, which is a huge IT challenge, which we've now been talking about for three or four years. And now we've got the introduction of this new GVMS system as well, which will be used for at least Roro ports, if not other ports as well. And so from a purely practical point of view, with five months to go, what are businesses expected to do with that new system? Um, do they need to lodge all of the information before they move their goods to the EU? Is there only a very simple amount of information that's needed? And then what you already alluded to, Maddie, is that we can't complete the picture on our own. Uh, there are things on the EU side which don't look like they're going to change. So full customs controls will be implemented from day one. So there's only so much mitigation that the UK government can do on their own because as it stands at the moment, any size business will need to pr produce an export declaration when their goods move out of the UK and into the EU and vice versa um, the other way around as well. So there are challenges and still quite a few holes. And what we ideally need from both sides, the UK government and the Commission, is for them to come together and actually say this is the end to end process. So all businesses can can look at those process flows and say, I understand these pieces uh, and this will help and I need to engage with a customs broker. But these are the elements that I'm also missing uh, and need to do more work on between now and the end of the year. That's really helpful. Thanks, Lloyd. I, I'm going to actually come back to you with a question from the Q&A. Um, this is sort of moving on. As, we, as we've already promised so far, we will be discussing the Northern Ireland Protocol. So if we if we discuss that now, because that is something that we know is going to happen at the end of the year or has to be in place by the end of the year. But there are still obviously some quite big outstanding um, details that have not been filled in, although the government is promising to do so in the next couple of weeks. Um, but we've got a question here from Adam Payne from Business Insider. Um, and his question is, what are the panel's thoughts on Northern Ireland not being included in the government's six month period of implementation from January to July? So basically, if GB businesses can't realistically be expected to be ready for full checks in January, why should Northern Ireland businesses be expected to be ready? And I appreciate that you're not necessarily speaking for businesses from Northern Ireland, but but what, what do you have any views on that the fact that we can sort of introduce easements for GBU but not between GB and Northern Ireland? Yeah so we've got a range of members based in Northern Ireland from bus manufacturers to engine manufacturers to converters so we do have an interest in making sure that the Northern Ireland protocol works. My sense from the question is actually this is a withdrawal agreement issue and were you to look to bring any sort of easement you'd have to renegotiate the withdrawal agreement because it's clear that the protocol will come in deal or no deal on the 1st of January so there will be potentially more requirements initially for GB to Northern Ireland trade then there will be for EU to GB with the phased introduction of customs controls there and this comes back to the systems point I also mentioned so we believe that GB to EU trade will be governed by chief with the new GVMS system but for GB to Northern Ireland it's the new CDS system which has been looked to be linked with GVMS as well so there are quite a few differences and discrepancies between the GB EU piece and the GB Northern Ireland piece and we've got members actually that export and import to both of them as well so are they going to potentially in parallel have to use Chief and CDS when none of them are on CDS at the moment so these are quite fundamental principles which we're still talking about rather than the technical detail at the moment I think the other 
crucial point is the at-risk goods and the qualifying status of businesses as well. Clearly, the qualifying status is needed for Northern Ireland to GB movements. What does that actually look like in practice? How does a Northern Ireland business gain that qualifying status? And also on the GB to Northern Ireland piece, there's the at-risk goods category as well, which if you're on that list, there's the potential that you have to pay tariffs upon import to Northern Ireland. What does the negotiations as part of the specialised committee under the withdrawal agreement look like? Uh, how can we make sure practically that our businesses aren't on that list? Of course, we don't want to be paying tariffs for moving a good within our UK union uh, at this stage as well. And how late are those decisions made as well? Because until we know what those look like and whether we are on the qualifying status list or and or the at risk goods list, you can't properly plan and know what's going to happen on the 1st of January next year. Thanks. Uh, Sonali, if I can turn to you now, I mean, one of the things I guess I'm interested in is this has obviously been a big, uh, Northern Ireland Protocol has been subject to a lot of discussion. Um, we know that a lot of the Northern Ireland business groups are sort of have been um, lobbying both the executive and the UK government around it. I mean, you, from your perspective, how aware are particularly those smaller businesses of that do trade from GB into Northern Ireland of the fact that changes will be coming down the track? Is this something that has largely been a sort of Northern Ireland centric discussion? Or do you think that there is an awareness within Great Britain that these changes are happening and it will impact how those traders uh, sort of trade goods into, into Northern Ireland? Thanks, Maddie. I think there's a theoretical awareness. I mean, given the profile of the Northern Ireland protocol in, in sort of both the withdrawal agreement and, and ongoing sort of work through the Joint Committee. However, the reality is that there's no real detail on it. So smaller businesses are only going to really respond when they see a clear process that they're going to have to follow. Um, and, and as the gentleman before me described, you know, at the moment, we're not clear how this system is going to work. How will there be a dual system for at risk and non at risk goods? Um, how will there be um, or will there be some kind of sort of stress testing of models such as, you know, self certification of Northern Ireland traders that actually their dead end hosts, i.e. the good is not going to go into wider free circulation. It's going to remain within Northern Ireland. I mean, how will all of that actually work in practice? And until we see, and particularly until smaller businesses that are very practical, um, very logical, sort of really want to know, OK, we will work with a process. But the starting point has got to be to know what that process is and at the moment there's not even really clarity between you know what's an at-risk good and what's not an at-risk good. Thanks and if I if I turn to Ian now as well I mean on, on this specific point of the Northern Ireland Protocol I mean the food and drink sector is one of the big sectors that presumably will be impacted by it. Um, how much awareness do you think there is um, for those in G based in GB trading as Northern Ireland about what those changes will be and, and so what more clarification are you looking for from the government? Well, I think the concern is huge. Um, I mean, Northern Ireland and the U and the and the Great uh, Northern Ireland and Great Britain are inextricably linked, but their food industries are somewhat different. So, Northern Ireland is essentially an agricultural economy and produces enormous amounts of milk and meat. Um, there is manufacturing, of course, um, um, but the balance of production between Northern Ireland and the and the rest of the UK is quite different for example, from uh, to that between Scotland and the rest of the UK or Wales. And so the, the, the it disturbing that, disturbing the ease of trade will have quite significant implications. And one of the concerns that I know multiple retailers have is, and they're very important for shipping products that's made in the U, made in Great Britain to stores in Northern Ireland and the Republic. Uh, one of their concerns is it's just going to be too expensive and too confusing and too complex to do business with multiple loads. Um, and I mean, I've seen some figures from um, our sister organization in Northern Ireland that suggests a multiple load of, of a consignment with lots and lots of different elements to it could cost in terms of time taken and uh, because each part has to have a different declaration and there are uh, 11, uh, potentially 11 declarations for food that each food consignment going to Northern Ireland has to have, um, you could end up with a, 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 a large lorry that would cost up to tens of thousands of pounds in terms of time and uh, so on to deliver to Northern Ireland. Ultimately, it's a market of one and a half million people um, and some businesses will just say too difficult. 
and they will stop trading with Northern Ireland until it becomes easier. Now, it will become easier um, because consumer demand will make it easier. The government will have to re respond to the demands of shoppers and consumers to make trade easier. That is what happens uh, in most situations. But it could take a very long time. And if you were a Northern Ireland shopper who had liked a particular store or a particular brand, and it suddenly became unavailable because of the Northern Ireland Protocol, you might well take a dim view of the of the efficacy of the union. Um, and I think in the end, and, and this is something that I know a lot of very senior politicians have pointed out, that, that if it looked, the whole point of the protocol, of the, of the argument is to keep Northern Ireland in the UK. If the whole point of it is lost by the, uh, by the unintended consequences of the protocol, then the question of the efficacy of staying in the union, one or other of them, I don't mind which, it could be the European Union, could be the United Kingdom, will come up as a political issue. And this government will be desperate to avoid that. All governments will be desperate to avoid that. So what will happen subsequently is there'll be enormous amounts of attempts to try and ease the situation. There'll be post decision easements. But what Lloyd says is right. In the interim, there's confusion. There's I, I mean, I have used the word shambles. It is a shambles at the moment because with less than fewer than six months to go, nobody knows what they have to do. And because retailers particularly will turn away from this issue come the beginning of October because they have the most important Christmas in their history coming up, having had the difficulties of the, the last few months. Um, we have three or four months in effect to solve this. Now, I think the government can do that, but it really needs to get a wiggle on because if it doesn't, we're going to be we're going to see those sorts of consequences in the early months or they're going to have to do some very, very nifty footwork to suspend all sorts of parts of the protocol in the same way that they have with uh, with exports so far. Well, that sort of uh, paints a slightly bleak picture. I mean, based from what Ian's just said, so now you're just turning to you, I'm going to put another question from the Q&A to you. Um, sort of from what Ian said about planning and sort of lack of clarity and basically there were a few months to try and sort this or not. Um, Paul Hodges has said, you know, the whole Brexit period seems to have been dogged by a hope that somehow against all the odds there'll be an FTA and clarity in what's going to happen. Is it not now past time to accept there will be no deal and the business need to prepare on that basis? Do you think that now at this stage really no deal is, needs to be the baseline preparations? I think that there are certain changes that are going to have to occur irrespective of whether there is a deal or no deal. So, for example, preparation for customs declarations. And it's easier to persuade smaller businesses to invest time, money and attention on a change that they know will be necessary, um, irrespective of whether there is a deal or no deal. But right now, if you're a smaller business with limited bandwidth, limited cash flow, you don't necessarily want to make changes that may not be necessary if a deal is struck at the 11th hour. You know, that, that, that in essence, that is, from their perspective, a, a sort of a waste of financial resource that they can't really afford at the moment. And that's why the messaging, I think, in the government communications has got to be really, really clear about this is what you have to do in any event, whether there is a deal or whether there is no deal. Customs declarations are, are, are a great example of that. So, of course, is the Northern Ireland Protocol adjusting to that. And so, of course, will be the new immigration system. So in our research, we've identified that the average cost, we believe, of a sort of three year tier two general visa is around three thousand pounds. Now we've surveyed our members and basically a half, 48 percent of smaller businesses have said that these costs are unaffordable. So essentially the risk is we're locking smaller businesses out from being able to access international talent. And whilst we really welcome the reduction in the sort of the minimum salary threshold from 30,000 down to 25,600, um, our research shows that 58% of smaller businesses that are employing these medium skilled staff, these RQ, RQF3 and above, um, they do not pay at or in excess of 25,000 pounds. So that's why it's really important that this sort of system of tradable points, and particularly if you're working in a sort of profession, you know, in a, in a shortage occupation, 
as determined by the shortage occupation list. That's why it's so crucial that the flexibility is built into the system to enable smaller businesses to be able to access the talent that they're going to need to be able to, you know, recover from the coronavirus crisis. And it's really, really important to remember, you know, these changes are going to be taking effect. It's really important to remember that the vast majority of smaller businesses have had no engagement with the current sort of non-EA immigration system. So there, there are changes that are going to have to occur, whether there is a deal or whether there is a no deal. And I think the government's communication has got to be really clear on what those changes are. That's helpful. And that sort of takes me on to my final final sort of question. And I know that we're sort of at 11.30, but if we can have a couple more minutes of your time. Um, I think, you know, firstly to say we haven't really got into the questions around immigration, so thanks for flagging those. But I guess I'd like to ask each of the panellists, like, you know, if you can ask for one thing from the government, you know, they are starting to publish information, they're launching this comms campaign. Either do you have a piece of advice you'd give to them about how to try and approach this, or what is your one ask from the government? And if I could possibly sort of go through each of you, if I can start with you, George, what's your ask from the government from from the sort of services sector perspective a little bit on the hot seat um in the final couple minutes um so i think we are going to be reading the immigration paper that came out today very carefully there's 130 pages of it so really haven't had time to digest it because being here on the webinar um i think on the services side there are a number of unilateral actions that the government can take particularly around um, what's acceptable for short-term business visitors into the UK. Um, having an immigration system that works um, is so, so important to the services industry um, going forward. Great. I think that was, you know, you might have been on the hot seat, but that that seems like a, a reasonable request. Uh, Lloyd, what about you? What's your view of what um, what you'd like, the sort of one ask of the, of the government ahead of the end of the year? Yeah, aside from details, 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 I think it's some form of the Business Readiness Fund 2.0 that we saw in launched in August last year as well, which allowed us and other associations to really get out into the supply chain and those SMEs as well and actually be able to talk and coach them through the changes that are coming down the track as well. And in conjunction as and as part of that program of work, some sort of voucher scheme to give SMEs in particular, but all size businesses, the ability to access training and or consultancy for free. We've seen similar schemes be rolled out in Ireland and the Netherlands last year as well. And it just removes some of the cost barriers, which especially given the economic scenario we're in, the SMEs wouldn't otherwise look to go out and obtain that sort of training. Great. Um, Ian, if I can put the same question to you, um, what's sort of a one ask that you'd have of the government um, in terms of trying to support businesses getting ready for the end of the year? Uh, bring the same level of flexibility, resource and um, lack of ideology, uh, commitment to practicality to the next few months, particularly focusing on the Northern Ireland Protocol and ensuring that all the arrangements are in place and that they keep the food flowing. And in the government's own preferred words, get it done. Sonali, do you have uh, any final thoughts that you'd like to share with the government uh, at the end of the event? I would echo what previous speakers have said, the importance of a comms campaign being accompanied by hard financial support for smaller businesses that are really struggling at the moment, whether that's through Brexit advice vouchers, you know, if they want sort of information on how an adequacy agreement in the future may impact upon them, um, if they want to get additional support on how to prepare for customs declarations. Um, there have been examples of some of this occurring sort of last year and the beginning part of this year, but we really need to see that turbocharged charged. Um, because without that support, smaller businesses are really going to struggle. And it's time to put the, policy, the public policy arguments around sort of dead weight into perspective and to sort of recognise that the risk of, of so many smaller businesses simply not being prepared um, unless some hard financial support is made available. Well, thanks very much, Sonali. You had the last word. Um, that is all we have time for today. And I'm sorry that we ran over a little bit. I'd just like to thank the panellists for a really great discussion. I mean, we covered a lot of ground. There is still so much more we could talk about. And, and the IFG will definitely be hosting further discussions on some of these issues. Um, also, just to let you know that we are publishing a short paper on some of these questions next week. So do keep your eyes peeled. Um, if you want to listen back, the audio and video will be available shortly on our website. Um, and we have more discussions um, about uh, how government is dealing with Brexit and coronavirus and other questions available. Thank you very much for tuning in and please do join us again for more IFG live discussions.